welcome everyone and thank you for joining us here on the father show and i'm your host mike thompson today we have another fantastic show for you we have a great guest coming in today but before we get to that if you have not subscribed to our youtube channel please go to our uh the father show with mike thompson youtube channel hit that subscription button and while you're there hit that like button and also don't forget tell somebody else let them know that we are here we're here for not just for the fathers and not just for the men but we also want the women to watch the show and to understand what we are going through what we have to navigate through in this life of ours and if you are a man and you are looking for resources that can help you in a situation that you may be in please go to the father show with mike thompson dot com click on resources and there you can find resources that can help you in whatever situation that you may have and if we don't have it up there uh, please notify me at the father show at gmail.com now those resources are national and statewide resources so you can check in your state first and if you can't find it look at national see if it's a national resources there that can assist you so today we have a great guest and i'm really excited to have uh, Rachel Katz on the show. Now, Rachel teaches social and emotional learning skills to parents and children, and she has over 25 years of experience as an early childhood educator and school leader. Rachel was head of the Discovery School at the Bay Area Discovery Museum, head of the social and emotional learning for early years at Dewitt College in Beijing, and an elementary classroom teacher for preschool through third grade in public and private schools. In addition to working in school settings, Rachel has created and written television for Nick Jr. and Radio Television Hong Kong, and was a consultant for educational programs at Children's Television Workshop. Rachel holds a master's degree in education from Bank Street College and a BA from the Tisch School of the Arts at New York University. And today we're going to be talking about the importance of raising an emotional, intelligent children. And in this world today, with all the things that are going on and how we seems like sometimes the kids are just out of control. I think this is something that we need to really address and look at. And that's why I wanted to do this show today. And I'm so thankful to have Rachel here with us. So without further ado, let's invite Rachel to the show. Rachel, how are you? Hi, fine. Thanks, Mike. Good. Nice to be here. Well, good. I'm glad to have you here. It's, uh, it's wonderful to have someone with your expertise to come on the show and uh, you know like i mentioned in the in the introduction one of the things that's been bothering me is the uh, seems like the lack of emotional intelligence in not just the children but grown folks i mean you're seeing this on you know american airline uh, for instance there a guy walked up to the uh snuck up but really in my estimation he snuck up behind the flight attendant and whopped him on the head okay and then tried to ease and run his way on back to the seat like really and today i was watching a video where i can't remember what city was in but these kids was went into a hooters and they was trying to sell chocolate candy and i think the hooters management asked him to leave and a brawl broke out and, and mm -hmm. it's just unnecessary so you know I, I don't know if you could say why we have gotten to that point because I think that's a lot of people's issues we're wondering how did we get so out of touch with our emotions and knowing how to deal with that uh, but I don't know. Do you have any insight into that? Wow. Um, 
I mean, I'm with you. You know, I feel I feel really sad when I see those kinds of videos or I hear stories like that where someone just I guess what it is is that there's no pause button between the feelings and the emotions that you experience inside and then the actions that you take on the outside. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, what we try to teach and what we work with children to do is really help them to understand that inner landscape that's sending them information and signals. You know, mostly it's a tension mm -hmm. in the body. Um, it's like a tightness. Uh, and then from that tension that you're feeling in the body, what do you do with it? And if we teach children to pause and, and identify, yeah, I'm feeling this tension. I need to sort of go back to a, a, a physical feeling of balance before I make a choice mm -hmm. and act and respond. I'm going to make a choice that's going to be good for myself and for others. Yeah. Um, and then also, in addition to that, not only discovering what that physical feeling is, you know, being able to identify it, being able to say, I feel tightness in my chest, or I feel a lump in my throat, or, you know, s when I hear that, or when I feel that, um, when you say that or something, I feel some like a tension in my forehead. These are typical places where the body holds a reaction, a, a physical feeling to then pause and identify to name really what it, what i what you're feeling mm -hmm. you know for a child to be able to pause notice where the tension is identify where it feels physically in the body and then name it because what happens is is that we need to communicate to our to other humans you know through language that's what we do. And mm -hmm. when we don't have the language to be able to describe what we're feeling, we choose actions. Mm -hmm. And so having a large vocabulary and a, a precise vocabulary of language and emotions, sort of a nuanced vocabulary of language and emotion, if you will, helps the person who's feeling something be able to identify and communicate much more clearly to the person that they're trying to express their feelings to. Now, could that be why the, um, could it be that you've mentioned language and they should have, you know, more language and know and be able to express what they're feeling. With the kids today, a lot of everything is text. You know, they don't really know how to interact or they don't interact with each other very much. So what do you think that, you know, knowing how to say it is would be good and get away from, you know, looking at the phone and texting all the time, but learning how to communicate. Yeah, I mean, learning how to communicate is crucial, right? I mean, there's so, you know, when we think about the development of, of becoming, you know, being human, basically from childhood to adulthood mm -hmm. um, and we're thinking about communication communication goes directly hand in hand with something that we call executive function skills and those skills are you know being able to collaborate being able to control your impulses being able to work in a team being able to be resilient and when you have those skills there's all sorts of research that says you you know, your outcome in life, whether it's a job or in school or with your relationships is much stronger. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to think that those communication skills are going hand in hand with these executive function skills. Now you bring up an excellent point about texting and the way that kids communicate now differently. So my research and the, and the kids that I work with, um, and when we were at the Bay Area, when I was at the Bay Area Discovery Museum, um, it was a lab school. So we were taking research and putting that into like a, a into an applied practice, if you will. Okay. And I was looking at young children, you know, that's really my specialty is from, you know, birth to eight years. Okay. Um, and so those kids aren't necessarily using a text or a phone, mm -hmm. but they will eventually. So when your child is young, you can really help them to develop 
language and be able to say and express what they're thinking and they're feeling. And then when, as they get older, if they're going to text, you can also help them know that they don't have to respond to that text right away. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. that, you know, mechanism, what I spoke about earlier about being able to pause between sort of reaction and action. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. so you can think, how, how do I want to say this in my text? You can still be funny, you can still be clear, but you can also be kind and compassionate and say something that will be less inflammatory, mm -hmm. you know, or respond in a way. And then you have a whole host of emojis, which are really great. I mean, it's a way of just visually showing someone how you feel and, you know, letting the emoji express something. So you can send a smiley face or you can send a sad face or you can send, you know, the, the you know, a confused face. And that can also help someone to understand. But if you back up, you really need that language to be able to say, yeah, that's how I'm feeling, and then choose the emoji mm -hmm. that really can express what yeah. it is you want to say, what yeah, it is you want someone you to really, say. You really do need to recognize, and as early as possible, what you're feeling, what that emotion is bringing out, and you know, either stop it, uh, redirect it, uh, you know, something, but you don't have to always express it right off the bat, going from zero to a hundred and, you know, just firing back at somebody because you feel like you have to respond to whatever is going on in, or around you. Absolutely. So in our book, we, it's written in two parts. The first part is really the science of the development of emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. which is really fascinating. I mean, we when we pull, it's hard for us as adults to remember how we've developed, um, you know, because we can hold so much in our memory. We have big language, you know, big vocabularies, but a child doesn't, and they're on this incredible journey of development. And so the first part of our book really explains what that journey looks like from birth to eight. What does it look like to become an emotional being and to understand that you have thoughts, feelings, and beliefs that are, that are unique to you and that every single person around you has their own set of thoughts, feelings, and beliefs that are unique to them. And then you're trying to live in this world peacefully with each other. So the first part of the book explains that. Now, the second part of the book explains is a framework for what you can do with this to develop emotional intelligence and when you the first we call it the mind framework and it's it's an m for mindfulness an i for inquiry an n for non-judgment and a d for decide and this goes back to your point earlier about you have time to decide how you want to respond. And that's really important to remember, that there is a timeliness to each of our responses. Um, and when we get the timing right, we can be a lot more intentional and impactful with, our, um, with what we want someone else to know about how we're feeling and what our needs are. Yeah. And how do you recognize, you know, you said timing, uh, how do you recognize that? How do you come to say, OK, don't not yet. No, no wait a minute. Let me figure this out and <laughs> then express yourself. How do you come to that point? You come to that point by going back to the body and just asking yourself, where is there still tension? You know, is there a tightness in my body that's making me not yet ready to say what I need to say in a mm -hmm. kind way and in a peaceful way? Or not just say, but is, is there too much tension? Is there too much feeling? Um, it's sort of a tightness, it's a pull. I think we all know that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I try to explain to children I work with them, there's an expansion and a contraction. and. I'll, I'm just going to show you this. I always say to children, can you find the knot? <laughs> Do you know, there's like, and I show them this because this is what it looks like. And I say, okay, you have to unravel it, you know? <laughs> and I say, 
get get it loose, you know, <laughs> unravel it so that then there's no tension. There's that calm. <laughs> Okay. And you can go back to balance. I, you know, I, I use a lot of props when I work with, with young children in particular because it's hard for them to imagine these concepts. You have to make it quite yeah. concrete. But um, yeah, so you're looking for that tension. And if you feel it, it's not the right time. Okay. And let's say you, you, you feel it and then you feel calm, but just as you start to talk to your child, it's coming back and you feel it, pause wait and you can always go back and respond to your child a day from you know the incident or two mm -hmm. days from the incident when things have sort of settled down and you really know why you felt that way what you want to say how you want to express yourself i think as parents we often feel like i need to respond right away to my child i need to yeah. fix this and sometimes that quick fix really isn't the fix that we're looking for and, and as as a parent and you know i was a single parent for 11 years so raising mm -hmm. my son uh mm -hmm. through those times i you know i tell people all the time i know if i knew what i'm learning to like today and some of the other shows i've done i could have been a much better father but we weren't taught those these little skills before we became parents. And so for you, and I know you said you, you work with kids from birth to eight years old. How, how early can you as a parent start working with your children to learn these skills so they can grow up with them and carry them on into their adulthood? Okay, so first I wanna give a caveat to the first thing you said about being a parent. I'm a parent too. I have adult children. I, I, I am learning every day. I was not the best parent. I was, I mean, part of the reason why I wrote this book is because I needed to come up <laughs> with a framework for myself about how to not be so reactive as a parent. And as much knowledge as I have about child development and I work with children and I, you know, write stuff and publish stuff, I am not perfect. So I'm not, I'm not expecting any of the listeners to feel like they well, need to be a perfect parent either. And yeah. And the bottom line, not to cut you off, but the bottom line is yeah. there is no such thing as a perfect parent. There's no such thing as a perfect human being. So how can you be a perfect parent? So exactly. Yeah, right. So. And so rem everyone who's listening, remember that there is no perfect parent and we're all just doing our best. Yeah. So going back to working with young children, I always like to think about child development um, as planting seeds. Mm -hmm. Even if your child doesn't understand something yet, if you plant the seed, they're eventually going to grow up and learn and understand what it was that you were trying to explain and you were trying to teach. Mm -hmm. So as long as you have your core values set and straight and you have a sense of how you'd like to communicate them and what is sort of a, a no-go zone, if you will, you mm -hmm. know, and you follow those values and you're consistent, you've been planting those seeds all along. So it might look something like, let's say kindness is really important to you, you know, mm -hmm. just being respectful and kind to others. For a baby, it just looks like having your face, you know, because a child, a baby is looking at your facial expressions because they don't understand the language that you're speaking yet. So they're watching how you respond to things. Is your face, you know, is your, are your, the corners of your mouth turned up? Do your eyes sort of light up when you see the child or when your child sees you talking to other people? What does your body language look like? So you're planting the seeds of what kindness looks like and what respect looks like. Even if you say to your, your young child, you have to be respectful, they might not understand that word and what it means, but when they watch you behave and model in this way and they see your body language, they start to, to connect. Respectful looks like X. You know, respectful looks like what my father is doing. 
And so you're just always planting seeds. So I try to explain to parents to not get too hung up on the development of, you know, my child can't understand this, or I don't know enough about child development to be able to teach this. Just plant those seeds that are important and um, just be as consistent as possible with your values. Yeah, because, and I say this on the show all the time, that parents, we, and fathers and mothers, we have to understand that these kids are watching us. So they're modeling what they see. So if you are not modeling patience, you know, they're not going to model it either. You know, I, I, if you're not modeling kindness, as you were mentioning, well, well you think they're going to, they're going to look at you and say, well, Oh, so this is kindness. Oh, I can slap that person and that's kindness. Oh, you know, <laughs> you know, because if you look at if you look at an abusive and I'm just coming to my head, if you look at an abusive husband and he's supposed to be kind to his wife, but he's slapping her around, hitting her. That's what that child is looking at. Said, oh, well, that's how kindness is when you're treating a woman. Oh, so let me. That's what I'm going to do because that's what I'm learning. And we really have to get away from that, needless to say. But uh, it's important that we understand that how important what we do and what we say are to our kids. And as early as, like you said, from birth, because they're watching you, they're learning you, they're looking at your facial expressions, if nothing else. They might not understand the words, as you said, but they're watching your facial expressions and saying, oh, OK, well, dad's scared. He looks scared. Then I better be scared. Or if right. dad's mad, then I better be mad and on and on and on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, you know, at birth, what we're doing, if you think about the human species, you know, we're just, you know, these these human the, these animals, really, if you will, we are relational species, you know, so a child, a, a small, an infant, a young child needs to say, how am I to relate to all to to these others that look like me and behave like me? What do I need to know? So that's why they're paying so much attention and trying to make meaning of what you do so that they know how to relate in order to survive. I mean, these are kind of survival skills. So, and, and these are sort of the skills that we use back in the day. You know, now things are much more sophisticated, but still the evolution of humanity, you know, is really about learning how to relate to one another so that we can rely on one another for our survival. Mm -hmm. And so we forget, I think, how important body language is because we tend, specifically our culture, tends to use spoken language so much to sort of make sure that we're understood. But actually, when you're young and the, the roots of your development really were learning how to read and interpret facial expression and body language. So if you go way back to being a baby, that's, you know, that's the, why these seeds that you're planting are so important. Now, what other tools are, can a parent have to raise an emotionally intelligent child? You know, the tool that I really found was the absolute most helpful for me, um, which really led me to to write this book was the tool of learning how to be, you know, it's, it's a word that we hear a lot, but I'm going to use it is the, the skill of mindfulness. Okay. Um, basically what it taught me and what I was able to teach children how to use this is how to just be with myself sitting quietly and being able to label and understand um, the emotions that I was feeling and just observe them from a distance and get a little, you know, not necessarily identify those feelings that I was having of anger or frustration as, you know, as, as blaming myself for having them, but just being able to watch and see 
what happens to my body when I become frustrated? You know, what happens to, what are the thoughts that I have that lead to frustration? Really getting a pulling back and just being an observer of your own mind and your own feelings. And I would say that that is the best skill to start with. So if you have any curiosity at all about wanting to learn to meditate or do some mindfulness, I highly suggest starting with that skill. Yeah. Now, how can we pass that on to our kids? Um, there's in our book, in the second part of the book, actually, and also in the first part of the book, we give a ton of examples of how to use this and how to make, you know, those some of those meditation, those mindfulness skills really fun and user friendly for children. Um, you know, another way to do it if you have a young child is just taking some quiet time together mm -hmm. and set a timer on your phone. Just say, now is going to just be a quiet time for five minutes. We're not going to say anything. We're not going to try to be, you know, you can ask your child to be as still as possible, but if they want to move and wiggle, that's absolutely fine. Okay. But just take what we call five minutes of time in. Just go inward. Be with yourself, don't be with a device, and just feel your breath, feel your body, notice what you're thinking, and when the timer goes off, we can share what happened to us in those, during those five minutes. How early of an age can you start practicing that with your child? I would say you can start practicing at around when your child is around three years old. Okay. But five minutes is a very long time for a three-year-old. Even a minute <laughs> is a long time, right? So start with like a minute and you make it fun. Anything you want to introduce to your child, anything new that you want them to learn, you have to make it fun. Children love novelty. So if you're, you know, think if your body language is like, um, I want you to do this, or if you're demanding, your child is not going to be interested. But if you approach your child with this idea of like, hey, I have this great new timer on my phone, and I want to see if it will go off in one minute, <laughs> but hmm. it will only go off if we're really still and we're really quiet and this is the challenge you know, so make it fun make it like a game and mm -hmm. they'll want to do it now they're going to be interested in a game for about a week and then after a week they're going to be bored with that game so be ready to teach the exact same thing and do the exact same thing but come up with a different approach mm -hmm. so just be ready with novelty okay so you you got to switch it up a little bit you got to switch it up a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're teaching these, you're doing the exact same thing. The principles are the same, but the way you start it and finish it looks a little bit different. So your child thinks it's new. Hmm. Okay. Now, would, let me ask this, you know, when kids start going to daycare and the school, does peer to peer play a part in their emotional development? Yeah, I mean, peer to peer is huge. And, you know, the older your child gets, the more influence they're going to have on their peers and the less influence they're going to have from you, which is why it's really important that you start planting those seeds when they're young. Because even though their peers are going to influence them a lot, the foundation of who they are is set and shaped by you, you know, by their primary caregivers. And so just never think it's too early to start teaching your child your values and, you know, your North Star and how you, how you believe that a person should behave in this world. Hmm. Okay. Now, now, how long do you think that a parent could keep this practice going with their child? Be more specific about the practice. Well, Which practice to, do you practice? The sit down and meditate together, um, really mainly that. The, you get together and you meditate for 5, 10, 15 minutes. And as you like to say, when you get older, you can do it longer. 
But we know in when they get into the teen years, like you mentioned briefly, you know, you're going to have less and less contact with them because they're going to be want to be with their peers and their friends. Is it something that you still think you can set a day and a time aside every week or every day to practice? So meditation was just one example. And in the book, we have lots of different examples that you can do to just spend that time with your child. Mm -hmm. I, I just use meditation as the first example. Um, I love the idea that you mentioned of just setting a time aside that's a parent-child time. Mm -hmm. um, because let's say meditation doesn't work for you or you want to explore something else or you happen to pick up our book and you're like, oh, this is, a, I, I like this idea, so I'm going to follow with this. You just, if you set aside a time and you're consistent, you know, with, you know, obviously schedules change, but let's say you make, you try to set aside a time once a week. The mm -hmm. time might change, but at least you've set that time aside. What's gonna happen is, is that that time that you're with your child and that you're doing something with them is gonna become part of their memory bank. Mm -hmm. And when they go back to, it's gonna become part of their felt experience, if you will. They're gonna know what it felt like to be with you during that time. You know, and if it was a meaningful time, the time that you could both be together and you were both sort of less reactive with one another and just in a in a neutral, comfortable space, those are times where the body and your thoughts remember what it was like to be at ease mm -hmm. with, you know, let's say your father, for example. The other thing that's important, um, not only setting a time apart, setting aside a time, but just remembering that you know, your child is going to be different from you and how they react to things and respond to things is going to be guided by their own sort of inner world. And so when you do set aside time together to be with your child, let your child lead as opposed to you telling your child what to do. As parents, we often want to tell our kids, this is what to do. This is how to do it. This is how you should feel. Mm -hmm. But really, when we're talking at our children, we don't know how our children are feeling and how our children are thinking. We don't know, do they even have the language to be able to tell me what they're thinking and feeling? Mm -hmm. Because I'm just talking at them. So whatever time you do set aside with your child and you're doing something with them and you know what you know, value you want to impress upon them, lead with questions as opposed to direction. Okay. So asking instead of telling. So if you're doing this meditation together, you know, tell them this is what you're going to do, explain the timer's going to go off, but don't tell them how to feel. Don't try to control how they behave. Mm -hmm. You know, then ask them what happened, you know. I have a lot of parents, instead of doing meditation, sometimes they'll do some drawing with their children and they'll mm -hmm. just draw side by side. And then afterwards, you know, they'll set their timer and it'll be that one minute so that they're not sitting in silence trying to be still, but they're doing something but quietly. Then they'll say, well, what did you draw? What were you thinking? Tell me about that. And so, you know, you just get a sense of who is my child? What do they know about their inner world? Mm -hmm. What are they feeling? What are they thinking? How can they express themselves? What do I need to know as a parent about my child? Now, and yes. they, children, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna oh, say yeah. children tend to remember when they've been given attention mm -hmm. and when they've been asked. They don't remember what you say to them normally when you just talk at them. So giving them that attention is what they remember. Yeah, the attention through inquiry, through yeah. asking questions, through being curious about them. Now, now, if you have multiple kids and, you know, you are want to set aside a time for them as a family, everybody as a whole to get together and do something, draw. Uh, cook or, you know, meditate or whatever. 
can is that something that's feasible? Can you do it as a group or should you do it as an individual child? I mean, there's no should, right? There's okay. no, here's the thing. We all know what happens in family dynamic, right? There's usually you, there's one of you and more of your children and they <laughs> all want your attention. And the way they get your attention is going to be different. You know, you have the one child who's the pleaser, who's always trying to do the good thing and get noticed. You have the other child that might try to get noticed by doing the things that annoy you or that try to get your attention that make you angry. Mm -hmm. And then you and then, of course, there's a relationship between the children that's been developed. Mm -hmm. You know, again, remember, we're relational species. So we're developing relationships all the time and trying to figure out not only how we work well together, but how we, you know, what makes us angry and what, yeah. you know, we're trying to figure that all out. Um, so if you try to do something as a group and as a family, you have to be ready to be non-reactive. So as the parent, as modeling, as leading something, let's say you decide you're going to make some cookies together. Mm -hmm. If all your ingredients, everything's going well, you know, one child is, you know, let's say creaming the butter and mixing the butter and the sugar and the other child's eating the chocolate chips. And then, you know, and one child is telling, you know, dad, dad, you know, she's eating the chocolate chips. You see, dad, dad, she's eating the chocolate chips. And then the other child, no, I'm not eating the chocolate chips. And then the fight starts out. <laughs> so you as a parent, Here's your time that you're modeling, that you want to have this family time. You have to stay as non-reactive as possible. Just, you know, um, that figure that, you know, that tree that no matter how hard the wind blows, the tree doesn't fall over. Mm. And can you be that person? So while there is all this commotion externally, can you internally be as still as possible? So yeah. it's a time, you know, during, if you're going to try this with the whole family, it's a great exercise actually to say, okay, can I be this tree? Can I be rooted? Can I not be pushed over? Mm -hmm. Can I remain, you know, standing tall and see if you can do it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like setting you know you've already know that you're going to try to have this family time together you can try to take it one step further and set an intention of like okay my intention is going to be can i be this tree can i stay rooted yeah and and you really i think you know just from experience you have to talk to yourself and and like you said earlier, understand and recognize what's going on in your own body and, yeah. and catching that before you say something or do something that you shouldn't. Right. Exactly. I mean, and you don't even have to have the why, you know, often we want to know why am I responding this way? Just ask yourself what where is the tension? What am I physically feeling? And, and then do I want to respond to this or do I want to wait until that tension eases and I feel that expansion? You know, that expansion that you feel. Um, it's a physical feeling, but when you feel that, that's when you make good decisions. Hmm. You know, that's when you get to a place of balance and equilibrium. That's when you feel steady. So and, you just and that's something wait. that you can teach your kids. I mean, to be able to express that to you, like, okay, uh, dad, I'm, I'm feeling anxious or dad, I'm feeling mad because you changed the channel or, you know, or you didn't take me to the ballpark like you promised. Uh, yeah, we can, I mean, help teach our kids to express themselves a little better. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to notice, okay, so that anxiety, where, does, where do you feel it physically? Mm -hmm. You know, I have lots of children that are able to say to me, you know, it feels, like, it feels like something pushing against my stomach 
or I feel a fluttering in my chest. Children in many ways are much, because they might not have the word of anxiety, for example, mm -hmm. that's a pretty right. sophisticated word. Yeah. They do have a, I mean, they've been learning about the world through their senses, you know, through touch, through taste, through smell, through sight, through sound. They're much more connected to their senses than adults are in many ways. Yeah. Because once we have language and we're off and running, we rely on language to communicate and learn about the world. Children rely on their senses. So it's in some ways when you teach these things to children, they get it right away. They're mm -hmm. like, oh, I know where I feel that in my body. Yeah, it's really tight. You know, and then you say, okay, can you wait? Can you count to five and see what happens? Do you, that, does that, yeah. you know, do those butterflies go away? Should we put a should we put a label to those butterflies? You know, what was it that you wanted? How did you feel? And then you build the language from there. And we as parents should not think of a child as necessarily not knowing and not understanding, because I think we as parents sometimes believe that our kids don't understand as early as they do. You understand what I mean? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. children understand so much, but they don't have the ability to express what yeah. they understand. There's also a really interesting um, development of understanding. By 18 months, your child is able to track what likes and dislikes are, like okay. what you like and what you dislike. But they're not able to say, oh, I think my dad is feeling X you know, mm -hmm. because of this. They just don't have the language to think that way, right? But then, you know, you're progressing, they progress, they get a little bit older, and then they understand, oh, different people have different beliefs. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, that's really cool. So they're just kind of layering knowledge. You know, first they understand, oh, you like broccoli, I like ice cream. So then they bring you broccoli and they choose the ice cream mm -hmm. and then they layer mm -hmm. on top of that. Oh, a belief, you know, um, like a belief that let's say that dogs don't bite everyone, you know, like someone has a belief. So they and then they layer on top of that. Then the next thing that they get is an un and this is all a developmental progression. Every person walking this earth follows this developmental progression. Then they understand, oh, there's this thing called false belief. Like people are walking around with some false ideas. Mm -hmm. And then that's pretty interesting. And then they develop another set of, um, you know, of understanding where they realize, oh, I can, I have separate feelings. I'm like a person that has thoughts and feelings and ideas and beliefs and likes and dislikes. And because now they know that there's this false belief, they realize, so they're always layering what they know. Then they're, they think, oh, I can lie. Hmm. You know, I can, I can fool someone. That's very sophisticated thinking. And they get that at around like school age, you know, okay. like four or five years old. Okay. And then, then they realize, oh my goodness, everybody around me is thinking and feeling and even if they're not showing how they're feeling they can look happy but have a completely different feeling inside and so then they get really sophisticated about understanding it's it's, it's sort of in the developmental world of sort of child development it's called interpretive theory of mind mm -hmm. where they start to then think about you know, we all have a stream of conscious. We're all walking around thinking, feeling, able to hide our thoughts, able to hide our feelings. And that's really, and that happens around like seven and eight years old, where that's really when we can do some of the greatest teaching with our children and really plant some of those seeds. But we can plant seeds all along, you know, from birth, as we've been talking about. Yeah, because I think we as we have to understand we are planting seeds all the time. And yeah. from the day they come out of that womb, we are planting seeds into our kids. And I think fathers and mothers 
we need to understand that and recognize that. And and I, in, in some estimation, I would say mothers may know that more than fathers, but we still have to recognize that these kids are learning because I always look at it as, you know, you mentioned facial expressions. When a kid falls, the first thing they do is look up at the parent to see what their the parent is, what their expression right. is on their face. And if they got, oh, oh my goodness. And then they right. were like, I'm hurt. But they right. weren't hurt until they saw your expression and you feel, oh, the child is in my mind. The child is like, oh, shoot, I should be hurt because look at my mommy's face or my daddy's face. Right. Yeah. No, it's very interesting. And and then also, if you think about their development and sort of look at your child with two lenses, you know, one with the lens of, oh, this is my child and I have this big responsibility with my mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. But the other lens of like, this is so cool. I get to watch human development. Mm -hmm. Like, What is happening right now? And how can I help? What do I need to know? What is you know, developmental, what is not, you know, then you really, you know, you, you get to look at your child almost like a scientist. You get to really <laughs> deeply observe, that's you know, true. and that's, that's true. That's right. I mean, and it's not to say you don't love them any more, any less, but it can take a little bit of pressure off the parent too. Yeah. When, cause as parents, we can put a lot of pressure on ourselves. Well, and you know, yeah. some parents look at the child when, when it's born and said, oh, well, God, I'm going to screw this child up because, you know, because right. they know they're not <laughs> necessarily right, but they put that pressure on them like, oh, God, I don't want to screw him up or I'm going to screw him up or, you know, but as we mentioned earlier, there's no such thing as a perfect parent. You got to keep learning. And, you know, that's why, like me, I have three grandkids. I take care of my grandkids a lot different than I took care of my kids because I've right. learned the knowledge I've learned from being a father to a grandfather is why. Right. I mean, wisdom is such a great gift, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, wisdom and time and we just sort of relax. And we yeah, learn from I our mistakes. Hopefully, you know, you learn from the mistakes that you make. Yeah. Or yeah. have made. Yeah. 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 And, and our kids, you know, when we allow our children to learn from their mistakes, I mean, look, we have to choose which mistakes we want them to learn mm -hmm. from and which, mm -hmm. you know, when we want to jump in and say, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to sort of uh, not let them make that mistake because mm -hmm. it's too big a mistake for them to make. The repercussion is too big, you know, but absolutely, you know, let them fall, let them, you know, let them get back up, let them see yeah. what it feels like if they're unkind to a friend, let them see what it feels like, let them observe how the friend responds, you know? Yeah. Now, I, you yeah, know, I was you. excited when I came across your profile on LinkedIn and saw that you wrote this book of the emotional intelligent child. Why were you eager to come on a father show to teach fathers about this? You know, I lived for a long time in Asia and um, and part of the work that I would do was working with parents. And for some reason, a lot of the parents preferred to meet at, the mothers would meet in a group and the fathers would meet in a group. And and I was fine with that. Um, and I just was what I learned about the fathers was how committed they were to their children. They were as committed to being the best parent they could be as the moms were. And they had great questions. Um, and so I just often feel like sometimes when we think about parenting, we just assume that the mom is gonna, you know, is gonna pick up the slack or the mom is more interested, but in fact, what I discovered were that the fathers were absolutely as equally as interested, but they had a different way of showing it. And they had a different, they were just asking different questions um, yeah. and trying to, so yeah, so 
I always say, let me talk to moms, let me talk to dads, let me talk to parents, let me talk to primary caregivers, let me talk to grandparents. Yeah. Doesn't, and it's really just whatever will benefit the child because children are our future. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it really, we, I mean, fathers are going to look at it in a different lens than a mother. You know, yeah. either, either way you look at it, I mean, there are women that are, can think more like a man and there is men that can think more like a woman, but you still, a, a man is still going to look at things a little different than a woman. And to me, that's why I always say on the show that both parents are important to a child because there's certain things you can learn from a mom that you will not learn from your father. And there are certain things you're going to learn from a father that you will not learn from your mother. Well, and in the father groups that I ran, the most amazing thing was how these fathers bonded. I mean, mm -hmm. when we brought the fathers together and they just started, they felt safe to share and ask the questions that they needed to ask. And they were vulnerable. And, you know, one father would turn to the other father and say, oh, my gosh, I know exactly how you're feeling. <laughs> and then by the end of like six weeks, everybody had each other's phone numbers. Mm -hmm. Everybody was they, you know, they nobody felt alone in this father mm -hmm. journey that mm -hmm. they were on. And they all were so grateful, you know, and they just left with a team of people that they could turn to when they had questions about being a father. Yeah. And that was the most important thing to me. Like none of us should feel alone in raising right. our children, you right. know, and if fathers feel better about talking to fathers, then let's create those father groups and like, let's, you know, give everyone those resources and opportunities to just yeah. share and, and ask questions. Yeah, in a safe environment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But Rachel, mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's going to be our time for today. But before we go, how can the audience get in, uh, get your book and where can they find it? Um, the book is available. Uh, I mean, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it at your local bookseller. I know they have it at Target. They have it at Walmart. They have it every, you know, it's it's pretty widely circulated. I've noticed that a lot of libraries carry the book too. So if you don't feel like buying the book, you can absolutely take the book out from the library. Um, and then I'm also working on some new projects now for children. So keep your eye out for those. Um, yeah. And if you read the book and you have any questions or, you know, you want to know how to do some of the exercises that we explain in the book, if you want to know how to do some of them differently, feel free to reach out to me. I'm available through LinkedIn. You can just find me if you type in my name. Okay. Well, that's great because I, I'm hoping a lot of men do. And, you know, it is great. And part of what we do here on this show is to try to educate more men to, so they can have the knowledge and know where they can find the knowledge to be the best version of themselves. And so I want to thank you, Rachel, really for coming on the show and being eager to come on the show to talk to our fathers about themselves and their kids and how we can actually raise emotional intelligent children and i really wish that i had this book and had met you before uh i became a grandfather and before my kids got grown because i would have loved to have been a better father to them but as i look at it personally i'm not done yet because my kids are still around i'm still a father um, I'm just yeah. a grandfather go along with it. So I still have lessons that I know I need to teach my kids and my grandkids on top of it. That's so great to remember that we were once we're a parent, we're a parent. <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't stop. <laughs> and doesn't that's what stop. I, I like to tell people, you got to remember once you have a kid, it doesn't stop even after 18. Right. Absolutely. 
Well, thank you so much for having me, Mike. It's just a pleasure to speak with you. Yes, Richard, it definitely has been a pleasure. And I really, you know, when you have some more stuff about kids that you want to come on the show and and that will benefit the fathers, please let me know. I'd love to have you back on the show and maybe your co-author as well. I got to work on that. I got to spend a little money to get that other part of the program, but <laughs> so I can have more than one camera. So we'll work okay. on that part. <laughs> yeah, that one's great. <laughs> well, thank you so much. All right. Well, Rachel, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is our show for today. And I really want to thank Rachel Katz, who wrote the book, The Emotionally, Emotionally Intelligent Child. And it really is something that you hopefully have gotten a lot from today and i think if you really want to raise an emotionally intelligent child really want to be the best father you can be you would definitely listen to this you would definitely read rachel's book and and put some of that practice in play so that way that you can have uh, the best child that you can possibly raise and be the best father that you can possibly be. So before we go, if you have not subscribed to the Father Show with Mike Thompson YouTube channel, go there, subscribe. And while you're there, hit that like button. And don't forget, if you are looking for resources, you can go to the Father Show with Mike Thompson dot com. Click on resources and there you can find national and statewide resources that can help you. And we're working on our website so we can have Rachel's book and other guests book on the show. But as you heard from Rachel, you can find her book everywhere. I mean, if you can go to Amazon, Walmart and other bookstores so you can find it. The Emotionally Intelligent Child. Go get it, read it and put it to work. All right. So until I see you next week, God bless you all. Love you. And I can't wait to see you next week.